All right, our scripture reading today then is 2 Timothy chapter 3. But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, Not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these men opposed the truth, men of depraved minds, who as far as the faith is concerned are rejected, but they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? The persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you... Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So if you own a personal Bible, please raise your hand. All right, very good. If you brought your Bible with you today, please raise your hand or hold your Bible up, one or the other. Okay, good, good, good. If you don't own a personal Bible, I want you to come up to me afterwards, or don't even have to come up to me, and get yourself a Bible. Just come on up and take one. I want every person who comes into this church to have a personal Bible. We've got some new ones here. We've got some teen study Bibles, some, some Bibles for kids. I'm very serious about that. If you do not own a Bible, please come take one at the end of the service. The Bible is the most important book you can own. And not just own it, but also use it, learn it, read it, study it, get to know it. We're going to see in the scripture reading today, it makes us wise for salvation. So if we have not yet been saved, the words of God will lead us to salvation. But it's also good for teaching and correction, and reproof, and for training in righteousness, and we'll talk about that as well. It is God's very Word, and I want that to sink in a little bit, because I think from time to time, or probably most of the time, we begin to take the Word of God for granted. I mean, Bibles are everywhere. I've got a stack of them over here, and I'm giving them away. You can go anywhere, and there's Bibles everywhere. There are Bibles in hotel rooms. They become so prevalent that I think they've lost some of their meaning, or some of their value. And that's really tragic, because if you look back into the history, and as we've been looking at history each and every week, I'm going to go back to 1536 and a man named William Tyndale. Now, even before the Reformation began, brave men were beginning to translate the Bible out of Latin into a common language so that their own people could read it in their native tongue. Men like John Wycliffe, and he was put to death for it. A man named Jan Hus in Czechoslovakia, or what is today Czechoslovakia, translated the Bible into the Czech language. He was burned at the stake for that. The Roman Catholic Church at the time was keeping the Bible in Latin, and it was the domain of the clergy and the priests. The regular people just could not have one. Some of the reformers saw the Bible in the common language as a way to overcome illiteracy. And so they had a social reason behind it as well. But most of all, it was a spiritual reason to get the very Word of God in people's hands. They believe so much that the Word of God is not for the priesthood. The Word of God is for the people. 
And we tend to forget that, that people died. And another one was uh, William Tyndale. William Tyndale was a reformer in the uh, 1500s. And he was a scholar. He wrote many books. He wrote one book called The Obedience of the Christian Man. In that book, he argued that the king of a country should also be the head of the church, which was radical at that time because the pope was the head of all churches everywhere. And it was that book that encouraged King Henry VIII to go ahead and proclaim himself the supreme head of the Church of England. And so Tyndale had a a direct impact on Henry VIII. Now, unfortunately for Tyndale, he also was a huge critic of Henry VIII. Henry VIII wanted to uh, take over the church so that he could give himself an annulment and get rid of his wife, Catherine of Aragon. And when he did, he got remarried, and William Tyndale spoke out against that and said King Henry VIII was doing something wrong. And so for that, he got arrested and tried and convicted. And one of the heresies, quote-unquote, of William Tyndale, he had translated the Bible into English so other Englishmen could read it. And so on October 6, 1536, William Tyndale was also executed. He was taken to be burned at the stake, and I'll say he was mercifully strangled, which that sounds strange, But before they burned him to death, they actually strangled him and then burned his body. All because he translated the Bible from Latin into English so that people could have it. And I tell you those stories because I want you to just know how important this book is. This book has the word of life in it. And we need to really revere it and hold it dear to our hearts and and have it be our constant companion. All right, so let's get to our Scripture reading today. In it, Paul is going to encourage young Timothy about using the Scriptures. He's going to use it because there's trouble in the church. We're going to find that there's two sets of people in the church, the ungodly and the godly. And that might sound strange, but that's that's the truth. Throughout Scripture, we find false prophets in the Old Testament, false teachers in the New Testament. And Paul is going to tell Timothy how to deal with it. Now, Timothy, if you're not familiar, he was a young man. He was appointed by Paul to be the pastor at the church in Ephesus. This letter, 2 Timothy, is probably Paul's last letter. He was in prison in Rome facing execution. This letter was written probably 67 or 68 A.D., weeks, months, maybe days before Paul was executed by the Romans. And so he writes this encouraging letter to Timothy to help him in his ministry with this church, a young man who is facing trouble. So let's start out at the beginning of chapter 3 and see what kind of ungodly people there were. Paul says, In the last days there will be terrible times. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, and so on. Now, if we read that list and we read it in the context of the world, the world out there, outside the church, that might be one thing. But the sad truth is, Paul is not talking about the world out there. He's talking about some people within the church of Ephesus. Some of the people within the church had these very characteristics. And these people were stirring up trouble for Timothy. It goes on to say that these people have a form of godliness, but deny its power. They appear to be good Christian people in the church. They appear to be coming and going to their studies and reading their Bible and all those different things. But they've never come to a true knowledge of the truth. And their evil hearts are causing them to cause trouble for poor Timothy. Timothy is a young man. Paul wrote in the beginning that Don't let people look down on you because of your age. They're also probably attacking Paul's character as well. We're going to see that in a moment. But Paul, at this point in time, is in prison. He's going to be executed. So here are these dissenters within the church trying to stir up trouble for poor Timothy. And so they're both attacking Timothy's character as well as they're attacking Paul's. Well, why should we follow Timothy? He was put in place by Paul, and Paul's a criminal. He's in jail. That sort of thing. But worst of all, they're teaching heresy. They're teaching heresy not only in the church, but outside as well. And it says here, have nothing to do with them. Paul is telling Timothy, 
do not associate with these people at all. Then he gets very specific about these kinds of people. He says, they're the kind who worm their way into homes. This is verse 6. They're the kind who worm their way. That word that's translated here as worm in the original Greek describes liquid seeping into a fabric. If you spill something on a fabric, you know how it seeps in. That's what it literally means. It, the King James Version, I think, says creeps into home. But these people work their way into homes and they're wolves in sheep clothing. It says they gain control or literally take captive weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Now, don't get offended, ladies, by this phrase, weak-willed women. There's good women in the church, too, that we're going to talk about in a minute. But these women are the ones who are on the evil side as well. These women, when it says weak-willed, it also might be translated as silly. Uh, These are the ones who are the gossips. They're the slanderers. They're the women who are always stirring up trouble themselves. It says they're loaded down with sins and they're swayed by their own evil desires or literally their own lusts. So these evil men within the church are working their way into homes, sitting down with these women who should be doing the things they should be doing, which we'll talk about in a moment, but instead they're then feeding these women all this other heresy and gossip and slander and they're just continuing to make the church less and less healthy by loading on and these women are following behind it and they're listening to these heretical teachings but none of it is leading them any closer to the truth all right so i mentioned a couple of times the good women and if you just flip over to titus uh chapter two here paul is has another pastoral letter it's to the pastor titus who's the pastor of crete And he says in verse 3 of chapter 2, Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, or the women we're talking about, but to teach what is good. And here's what the older women should be doing. The older women of the church. They can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. So older ladies in the church, if you want to know what your role is, it's right there in Titus 2, verse 4. You have great wisdom. You've been around for a long time. I mean, time to time we talk about the anniversaries, you know, 25, 35, 45, 50 years. Some of you have celebrated marriages. You older women who have celebrated those marriages and have lived your lives and raised your children and done all those things, your ministry is not over. Your ministry is now to the younger women who are struggling with those very same things and need your wisdom to help them get through. But coming back to our reading, the women we're talking about are not those women. They're ones who are led astray easily. And the men who lead them astray, Paul Uh, relates them to Janus and Jambres. Now, if you hadn't heard those names, it's not surprising because it's only found here. Janus and Jambres come out of Hebrew tradition, and they were the two magicians who opposed Moses uh, in the Pharaoh's court. And if you don't recall that, remember that Moses and Aaron went before the Pharaoh to have the Hebrews released. Let my people go, as you might recall. And the Pharaoh said no. So, God brought plagues on the Egyptians. What we don't recall is the magicians in the Pharaoh's court duplicated many of those plagues, which continued to harden Pharaoh's heart. If you want to look back or reference Exodus chapter 8, I'll start with verse 5. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and canals and ponds and make frogs come up from the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land. But the magicians did the same things by their secret arts. They also made frogs come up from the land of Egypt. So we see that these magicians were also using evil forces to duplicate the miracles of God. And in doing so, that made the Pharaoh's heart even harder. Well, if God can only bring frogs out of the ground, but my two magicians can do the same thing, why should I listen to your God? And so this happens a couple of times in this scenario. But then it comes later in chapter 8, the plague of gnats. 
It says, verse 16, Then the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust to the ground, and throughout the land of Egypt the dust will become gnats. They did this, and when Aaron stretched out his hand with the staff and struck the dust of the ground, gnats came up among men and animals. All the dust throughout the land of Egypt became gnats. But when the magicians tried to produce gnats by their secret arts, they could not. And the gnats were on men and animals. The magician said to Pharaoh, this is the finger of God. So eventually, as the scripture says, these men are found out for the frauds that they are. And Paul says the same thing about the false teachers in the church. Verse 9 of 2 Timothy 3 says, but they will not get very far because as in the cases of these men, Janus and Jambres, their folly will be clear to everyone. So what Paul is telling Timothy is, you've got these false teachers in the church. You've got these evil men with evil desires who are stirring up trouble within the church. They're stirring up trouble for you. They're going to be found out eventually. So there's some encouragement there. Take heart. God will overcome. But Timothy, you have a role in that, and I'm going to tell you exactly what you need to do. But what we need to do before I move on from this idea of false teachers is be able to recognize false teachers and be able to recognize that they are worming their way into our homes as well. Now, they don't worm their way in the way these guys did. They're using technology today. So think about some of the TV shows, some of the TV preachers out there. There are some who are very good. There are some who are very bad. You've seen them preaching false gospels. Probably the biggest one is called the prosperity gospel. You've heard this one. If you send a check to me and you plant that seed, it's going to grow in your bank account, right? The prosperity gospel. If you do this, Jesus wants you to be rich. Jesus doesn't want you to be rich. Paul even said everybody who follows Christ is going to be persecuted in some way. There's nothing wrong with being rich, but the love of money is a problem. But these people that are preaching the prosperity gospel, there's some that's called the liberation gospel. Jesus didn't come to save souls. Jesus came to release you from whatever it is that you are oppressed by. And you can insert whatever group you want, but Jesus came to relieve people from oppression. Well, that's not true either. Jesus came to save sins. uh, Save sinners, excuse me. There's all different types of false gospels out there, and they're coming in through your television set. They're coming in through your computer. They're coming in through some of the books you may read. Some of the movies you may go see. You've got to be very careful about what you put into your mind. Because as I said, I think last week, when you become a believer, the Holy Spirit comes to live with inside you. Yet your sin nature is still there. And you have to make a choice. Am I going to feed the Holy Spirit within me or am I going to feed my sin nature? The one that you feed is the one that's going to take rule of your life. So feed the Spirit, and you feed the Spirit through the Word of God and through prayer. So how does Timothy, or how does Paul tell Timothy to deal with this? Let's come into verse 10 of chapter 3, 2 Timothy. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, and so on. Paul now is contrasting himself to these other men in the church. He started out chapter 3 with this laundry list of evil characteristics, abusive, disobedient, ungrateful, unholy, without love, and so on. Now Paul is holding himself up. Here I am. You know my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance. The tree is known by its fruit. So when you're looking at people in the church, people who want to be authority figures, look at their fruit not just the words they say. So Paul is talking about that. He goes on to talk about the sufferings that he has, has experienced. What kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra? Now, if you want to read that, go back to Acts chapters 13 and 14. When Paul preaches in Antioch, they stir up persecutions against him, and he flees to Iconium. When he preaches there, they stir up persecutions, and they start a plot to have him stoned. So he flees from Iconium. He goes to Lystra, these same men keep chasing him and following him along. And in Lystra, not only do they stir up persecutions and the plot, they actually do stone Paul. 
And if it weren't for the other believers, Paul probably would have died of stoning. But he's saved by the grace of God, as Paul even says. But these are the sorts of things that Paul suffered for the Gospel. And his point is, these other men in the church, who are the evil men who are stirring up trouble, would never stand up for this kind of persecution for the Word of God. They're looking for the easy life. They're looking for their own stomachs to be filled, as he says in in other writings. But they're not looking to be persecuted. And Paul says one of the things that will separate the true man of God from the false man of God is the fact that everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Jesus said, count the cost before you follow me. Being a Christian is not easy, especially if you live it out loud. If you're out there in the world and you take a stand for Christ, you will be persecuted. Now, I'm not saying you're going to get stoned to death or anything like that, but you're going to have friends who turn their back on you. You're going to have people who say things about you. But stand for the Word of God still. Paul now is going to give Timothy two reasons why he should stand firmly on the Word of God and what Paul taught him. Verse 14, it says, But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have become convinced of. Why? Because you know from whom you've learned it and how from infancy you've known the Holy Scripture. Timothy's got two witnesses in his life. The Apostle Paul and Scripture. And the Apostle Paul is preaching Scripture. The Apostle Paul is following Christ. And as Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, follow me as I follow Christ. If I am following Christ and you're following me, we're all going in the same direction. Paul is saying to Timothy, who are you going to follow? These evil men in the church or me? You've got a choice to make. You have a choice to make. Who do you want to follow? Do you want to follow the people who are going to lead you astray and off the righteous path? Or do you want to follow those who are living the godly lives and can continue to draw you closer and closer to Christ? That's a decision you need to make Paul tells Timothy, follow me. But then he goes into this idea of the Scriptures, and this is really, really key. And this is what I want to get to mostly today. He says, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures. Timothy was raised up in the Bible. Now, it wasn't the Bible we have today. It was the Old Testament Hebrew Scriptures. But Timothy was raised up in the Scriptures. You know, when I ask the little children today, do you have a Bible? And most of them say yes. Most of them got it when they got baptized here. We need to raise those children up in the Scripture so they know the Word of God. All right, we have to get into the Word of God first. All right, If we don't know it, we can't teach it. But our duty as parents and grandparents is to raise children up in the Word of God. And if we go back to chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, we read a little bit about Timothy's life. It says in verse 5, I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and in your mother, Eunice. So his grandmother, Lois, his mother, Eunice, were Jews. Timothy's father was a Greek. But those two Jewish women knew that they wanted that boy raised up in the Holy Scriptures. And so they taught him the Holy Scriptures, the Hebrew Scriptures. That made Timothy all the more prepared as a young man to be able to handle these situations and know what the truth really is. So point number one there, be raising our children up in the Holy Scriptures. The Scriptures, number one, make us wise for salvation. That's the first purpose of the Scripture, to bring us to God, to bring us to Christ, to turn from our sin and turn to the Savior. And that's what we should be driving at with our children as well. All right, in the Baptist tradition, we baptize people when they profess faith in Christ. And we've baptized little children, and I've baptized older people. It doesn't matter. The day you come to faith in Christ, you make that profession of faith, and shortly, shortly after that, you should be baptized. So it does that. And then it goes on in verse 16. All Scripture is God-breathed. God-breathed. That word is saying that None of the Scriptures came out of the men's own minds. As they're writing these letters and writing the Gospels and writing the Psalms and so on, all of this was given to them. It was a thought after God's own thoughts. 
And he gave them those words to write down. Now, he didn't dictate it to them. It's interesting. I've often heard that the best way to describe it is if you think of God's revelation as sunlight, and then the men who wrote it are the stained glass window. The light is pure, and it comes through the window, and the different characteristics, the colors and shapes of the men themselves give it its own texture, its own light but it's still God's light that shines through all scripture is God breathed if we go over to second Peter chapter 1 he tells us the exact same thing Peter says in verse 20 above all you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit So the Holy Spirit guided these men as they wrote the Bible, every single word, every jot, every tittle, as Jesus said, so that we know that the Word of God is true, inerrant, infallible, authoritative, eternal. It's here for us for all time. And then Paul gets a little more pragmatic. He says it's useful for teaching. This could also just be translated as doctrine. It's useful for doctrine or teaching. It's useful for rebuking, a word we don't use very often, chastising, getting after people who are saying heresy. If someone is out there preaching something that's not true, you use the Word of God to come back and say, no, that's absolutely not true based on the Word of God. So that's rebuking someone. They also have correcting. Now, correcting is to restore someone to morality. All right, we talked about this in the discipleship class on Wednesday, last Wednesday. We were talking about how, and you've, you've heard me say this before, and I love this, your position and your condition. Your position before God as a believer, born again, saved person, is firm, fixed, established, cannot change. God sees you as His son or daughter. You are saved, and you can't lose that salvation. But, That's your position. Your condition may vary. Just because you are the uh, uh, the adopted son or daughter of God doesn't mean that you don't wander away. Think of the prodigal son. So your position is firm. And they used the prodigal son in in the uh, lesson on Wednesday. The prodigal son left his dad. He was still a son, but he was far away from him. We're the same way. We are sons and daughters of God, but we from time to time wander away. And this word here, that's translated as correcting, means to bring some ba- someone back to morality. And then finally it says training and righteousness. This training word is a word that means lifelong learning. Cradle to grave. The Bible is for you. At Timothy, from infancy it said. If you've got little, little ones or little, little grandchildren or little, little great-grandchildren... Get them those little, little baby Bibles and let them just start reading about Noah and Adam and Eve and all those great little stories that we learn. All right, that's their first introduction. Get them started into the Scripture. Get them excited about it. Training in righteousness. Lifelong learning. You never, as I told the kids, never graduate from Bible school. And then finally, Paul says in verse 17, so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Right, if you go back to Ephesians chapter 2, it says that we've been saved by grace through faith so that no one can boast it's a gift of God. And then he says so that we can perform every work that God has prepared for us. Right, God has a job for you. I don't know specifically what your job is, but He's got a job for you. And He'll make it abundantly clear to you if you just open up your heart and mind to Him. It may be, as I said a moment ago, with the, uh, Paul's, Paul's message to Titus, that the older women should be teaching the younger women to love their husbands and love their children. Paul also says in Titus 2, he says to, to Titus, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith and love and endurance. He says about the young men, similarly, encourage young men to be self-controlled. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. Your teaching 
should show integrity, seriousness, soundness of speech that cannot be condemned, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Our life and our words are a reflection of who we are inside. But the Bible is a tool. It's a tool to use. And like any tool, think about it. If you, have, if you pick up a power tool for the first time and you've never used it, what's the first thing you're supposed to do? Read the instruction manual, okay? If you don't read the instruction manual, very likely you'll get yourself hurt or you'll hurt somebody else or you'll ruin whatever it is that you're working on. Get familiar with the tools of life. The Bible is your tool for life. You can teach. You can correct. You can bring people back to, to morality. You'll learn lifelong yourself and you can lead other people to Christ with it. So when I said to people earlier, when I started out, have you brought your Bible with you today? It wasn't to make you feel ashamed or to make anyone feel bad. It was because I want to make a point. If you're not bringing your Bible to church, you're probably not reading it at home either. If you are bringing your Bible to church, then you're probably reading it at home as well. It's your constant companion. If you travel on business, there's little Gideon's pocket Bibles in the back. Take one of those. And then you can read it on the plane. That's what I used to do. It was nice and easy and convenient. Whatever it is, I want you to remember and understand, this is the very Word of God. Think about that. The Word of God is in your own hands. How much closer to Him do you want to be? You won't get much closer than this. I want to close. I had said I was going to read from the Baptist faith and message. And the Baptist faith and message starts out with Scripture. The Scripture is the authority for faith and life. And this is what the Baptist faith and message says about the Bible. The Holy Bible was written by men, divinely inspired, and is God's revelation of Himself to man. It is a perfect treasure. A perfect treasure. It's a really good way to think of your Bible. A perfect treasure of divine instruction. It has God for its author, salvation for its end, and truth without any mixture of error for its matter. Therefore, all Scripture is totally true and trustworthy. It reveals the principles by which God judges us, and therefore is, and will remain to the end of the world, the true center of Christian union, and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and religious opinions should be tried. All Scripture is a testimony to Christ, who is himself the focus of divine revelation. You know, the men who gave their lives to, to get the Bible in our hands knew that and believed it. And like I said, they gave their lives for it. And I want to end uh, William Tyndale's life on a little bit happier note. Now, he was put to death. <laughs> they can't be very happy there. But right before he died, as they tied him to the stake, he prayed out loud. And he said, Lord, open the eyes of the King of England. Open the eyes of the King of England. Two years later, Tyndale's final prayer did come true. And so, I'll leave you with that. And praise God for His Word. And let's take a moment of silence to consider how blessed we are to have His Word.